Hey guys, I'm going to show you the best apparel shop in the world. Welcome friends to the biggest apparel shop in the world. Here you will find the latest trends in fashion and it's going to be super affordable too. Okay guys, I'm obviously joking. You can see all of the trends here are latest and absolutely free. And I have some data to actually prove it too. 60% of all apparel actually ends up in a landfill just like this. And the interesting thing is, the number of clothes is increasing every single year because people like you want clothes like this. And all of this is due to a phenomena called fast fashion. But what the hell is fast fashion? Whoa. So, Bobby? So at this point, I have to ask this question, Pratik. It's very lame to ask at this point, but what is fast fashion? People like us don't know what fashion is. So fast fashion, for advanced. Okay. So when you do a Google, here's what you get. Okay. Mass produced, mm -hmm. easy to purchase, easily accessible, new trends that happen all the time. Mm -hmm. I think a while back, they were only like winter and summer. Mm -hmm. And you know, you would change the clothes and guys like us, you'd be either Ganji mm -hmm. or no Ganji. What is Ganji? Ganji. What? Ganji. I, I don't come from your part of the country. Dude. What is this Ganji? Ganji looks like this. Okay. It, banyan. Okay. <laughs> okay. But now... Today I learned one more Hindi word. <laughs> but with fast fashion, okay. the fashion can change every single month. Sometimes okay. even faster. And I think what ruined it was the internet. Now that you have a phone and you can scroll, the next hottest thing is a few weeks away. Oscar Wilde says... A fashion is merely a form of ugliness so absolutely unbearable that we have to alter it every six months. <laughs> and so like you said, at one point, there were just two seasons, which is why Oscar Wilde said six months, we have to alter it, right? Now there are like 10 to 15 trends a year, like you mentioned, like 10 to 15 trends a year. It's not two seasons. So earlier there were two seasons because one is hot, so light clothes, one is cold, so different clothes. Now there are 10 to 15 trends in a year and... This actually means that if there are 15, a trend comes in and disappears within a span of 30 days. This, right, now comes the gravity of the situation. A trend that disappears before even a single month. That is fast fashion. Hold on, Abid. A trend that disappears before a month. Abid's fast fashion is pretty slow. No wonder he's a boomer. Fast fashion brands today produce new trends for up to 52 seasons a year. Why isn't anyone telling them they're actually called weeks? But how did we go from the slow yarns to fast fashion? It all started in the 1800s when humans discovered the sorcerer's needle. I mean, the sewing machine. A single machine that led to the exponential growth in cloth manufacturing, making clothes accessible to everyone. But until the 20th century, even with the textile mills, most of the cloth manufacturing was still done at homes or small workshops. However, the fashion industry changed during World War II. The exponentially high prices of fabric during the war brought out the creativity of designers who were forced to create practical designs with minimal fabric. The cargo pants you wear today, or the short skirts your girlfriend flaunts, emerged as the byproducts of the war. The necessity of the war became the modern day fashion. And with the new opportunity, fast fashion brands like <laughs> were born. In the 1900s, Zara entered the US with its quick supply chain model, unlike traditional fashion brands, which took 21 months to introduce a new lineup. A streamlined this process to create new products every four months. The NY Times coined the transition as fast fashion. Thanks to capitalism, other fashion retailers soon followed, and this trend created artificial scarcity by disposing of clothes every single week. Today, fast fashion brands just need 15 days to put new designs onto the shelves and the results of this sneaky little tactic has been rewarding. Really rewarding for them. You know, if owning a fast fashion brand makes you the world's second richest person, why wouldn't you start one? Now it's fast fashion, let's do the list of pros. <laughs> it's a little, little short. Okay, okay. A serious note, there is some credit involved. There is, there is. Listen, like, if you look at fast fashion, it meaningfully provides employment for a lot of people in less fortunate countries. 
I, I mean, India has a lot of people who work in fast fashion to give a clothes to like <laughs> and the world. Maybe not teens, but them. I guess there are people in India, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Southeast Asia, pura kabar plenty kabar of countries. Correct. Right. It's a lot of employment that they generate. Not just about the people who work in factories, also the people who are retailers. Also, people who help sell but, like. But anything which is scaled, no, Abid has that right. Outside of tech, maybe. But plenty of employment. But plenty of job and fair. We probably puts food in the mouth of people, right? Agreed. You have to grant. The second thing, of course, is look. I mean, you can judge people all you want for saying that. Hey, I want latest clothing, yeah, etc. But just like everything else. You can't be an ascetic, right? Clothes also make people feel good. Some people have body image. It's you have to respect their choices. As in, like we can't pontificate. Oh, look, I'm a vairagi man. But it works like magic, right? Like what you're saying. You're sitting one day, wanting validation from your life. Look, it's very simple. Going through your no, no, going no, no, through you your can't. social media. You can't look Hear me out. Hear me out. Okay. This is the consumption pattern. You're going through. You need some validation because you know we all do, and you're going through it, and you say, Oh, I don't have this overcoat. And with two special taps, there was more, but you get two. Spe- you get the point. That overcoat is delivered to my home the next day. It's beautiful. So accessibility is. I agree. It's a good thing. I mean, if we go to a place, travel, stay in a resort for two days for the sake of feeling great, yes. we can't criticize somebody who buys because both of them are polluting activities, right? At some point, you have to draw the line. Okay, this is too much. This is a line in the sand. But just because somebody buys clothes because he or she feels better wearing those clothes, you can't. It makes the person feel good in a certain way. Agreed. Body image, you have to. Good. And the third thing, of course, he is, is good, Uncle. Are you no? <laughs> third thing is, this is affordability. Also, it does a certain amount of uh, equalization of class in the sense that long time back. Uh, Access was only for the high street people. Correct. Right? Very rich people immediately going to Gucci or buying some stuff. Now it has become accessible to a lot more people. Yeah. Right. Again, you can go on to the tangent. Ki tumhe kyu chahiye? Tum to vairagi ho. Why do you have to feel like this? People feel like this. People feel like this. Think about this. The biggest USP of fast fashion is its price. The fast fashion industry has made clothing accessible for everyone, even though you compromise on the quality. It's allowed you to buy clothes on a budget. Without fast fashion brands, the middle class would probably not have access to the latest fashion trends and these beautiful clothes. The affordable fashion industry helps us bridge the gap between the rich and the poor. Then, of course, there's the economic benefit because clothing is now affordable. People buy many clothes. I mean, a lot. I mean, let's think about America because we have the data for them. They purchase about 64 clothing items a year, and that's just the average American. Thanks to these purchases in 2023, the global fast fashion industry was valued at 193 billion dollars. Um, बहुत सारा पैसा होता है ये. And this huge industry has another benefit: employment. Actually, I'm not sure if it's benefit really. You see, almost all the clothes we wear are stitched by hand by some person sitting on a sewing machine, and fast fashion companies hire thousands of workers who work 12 hours a day in small rooms without breaks to create your little poncho, your little piece of clothing. Your little piece of style. Had this industry not existed, these workers in small countries would probably not have any jobs and no food on the table. But even though these companies are providing employment, they're also exploiting these workers since they have nowhere else to go. So, is this really a pro or actually a con? Well, I'll leave you with something to ponder on. Now we look at the list of cons, <laughs> which is really long. So think about textile, right? There are two types. We have rayon and polyester. Now we know rayon is made with wood pulp, so it's like semi-synthetic, and yeah. they'll turn it and shiny, nice, looks very beautiful when you get, but degrades much faster. And there's polyester. The pura crude is made from oil. Yeah, it's literally made from oil. Yeah, yeah, I know. And uh, no, I'm st- I'm talking to them. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I know, I know. <laughs> I know you know for you guys. Okay, <laughs> right and. This is not like unused wood or thrown away. They're cutting down trees to make this sort of stuff. Now, of course, this is bad for the environment. But on top of this is the clothes that are made from this. One, the wear and tear is really quick, so it's designed in such a way that after a few uh, months, it actually by the tenth wash, I think, the kapda patne lagta hai. 
and it stops uh, being presentable, which is what you buy in the first place. And microplastics are actually in this. I didn't know this until we did research for the show. The microplastics comes from this. In the ocean, 35% of all microplastic yeah, yeah, yeah. is not that bottle that you're yeah, drinking yeah, yeah, out of. Yeah. It's from clothes, dude. It's from some teenager or people like us wanting some validation from the world, buying clothes My because it looks cool. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the fish are eating it. Yeah, yeah. So this is something which I found interesting, right? So I was planning to actually do that for this episode. I have a 15, maybe more than that year old t-shirt. Okay. Right. And uh, I think it's 2011 or 2008. It was from one of those, uh, like, uh, like somebody gifted me a French Open t-shirt, right? Like the one which players wear. Okay. Unreal how new it looks, right? No, it, it doesn't even have like the slight fibers degrading, not even that. So it was like built to last. It was a. It was used, worn by actual no players. Incentive, right, to do that anymore. At yeah. least for fast fashion retailers. The, the fast, fast fashion. The problem, of course, is you have to necessarily build the clothes in such a way that they degrade faster, so that the consumer is forced to buy a new one. But yeah, so there is overconsumption, which is an issue. There is the entire environmental eff effect of overconsumption. I think another thing which uh, people are. It's a double-edged sword in the sense that there's a lot of labor involved, right? Now, of course, fast fashion is fast, accessible, cheap, etc. because it is cheap. Mm. The problem with that also is it is cheap. In and someone else is paying the price for that cheapness. Price for that cheap. So, like, obviously, the people inside Vietnam, Bangladesh, etc., I know they are not paid a lot. But where do you draw a line? Because on the one hand, you can say that, boss, they are getting paid a lot. But on the other hand, you have to argue that they are getting paid something. Yeah. Right. So it's very difficult to uh, say that there has to be a minimum wage, etc. Because then maybe it won't be so cheap. So it's a complex. So you're saying a sweatshop yeah. is okay because it's providing some no, I'm level not saying, of income. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is that if the shop is not at sweat, maybe the supply demand of the world will change in such a way that maybe that shop won't even exist. Yeah. Right. And that's a problem. So we can't sit here and pass judgment, ki boss. You know, in Bangladesh, you have a sweatshop where people are getting nothing. The problem is, if it did not come at that price point, zero. maybe nobody would get nothing, mm. right? So, it's easy. Fair. So, it's a, it's fair, a very, fair. very tricky topic. 100%. If you've liked the episode so far, hit that like and subscribe and don't forget to comment. But this is what really, really worried me. So, I was actually... Um, or let me put it this way, right? What do you mean? So if I say Pratik involuntarily gave me money, what does that mean? Pratik's an idiot. No, okay. it, it doesn't mean that. It means that I forced you to give me money. Oh, like right? that. Basically, oh. or I involuntarily made Pratik work for me. Basically, I dunde marke, I made work. Correct, correct. So I was actually reading about right? And one of the reviews said there may be involuntary labor involved. I'm like, boss, what the fuck is this involuntary labor? What do you mean by involuntary labor? People involuntarily... Why, why don't you just... Sponsored article. I mean, why don't you just bloody call it slave labor? It's a very serious problem, right? So, and you have to again think of if China is getting slave labor extracted or yeah. quote-unquote, as they call involuntary labor, where is it coming from? Is it coming from Xinjiang? But you know where it comes from? Yeah. This comes from us. Like you and me and the people watching this, right? Like, think about it. Everything's demand and supply. We know the answer to this. The answer is very simple. We ask for cheaper clothes no, no, that's on a, that, time. That's an oversimplification. Because no, no, think about it, right? If the world starts demanding and saying, we want sustainable clothes. I, I don't know how this will happen, by the way. Why would someone want sustainable clothes en masse? But if, if they did sustainable clothes, um, which is affordable, and everyone's got decent pay at these places, I'm sure industry will figure it out. But there is no incentive for the consumer no, but, to demand but this that is, yet. This is where I disagree, right? Because um, if China did not do the kind of things it did, yes, right, it doesn't necessarily mean that we will not get something at a price point. I think it only means the profit margin a has will decrease if they are forced to pay better. Like, see, for example, right, I am not sure where the cheapness is coming from, number one. I'm not sure where the labor arbitrage is coming from. Mm. Is So there is a middle layer, right, which is the cost. And there's a bottom layer, which is the pat. Yeah. Assuming that the cost is inelastic or the price is inelastic and we are roughly going to pay the same thing anyway. Correct. By reducing the middle line, which is the cost of labor, people can increase their pat margin quite a bit. Yeah. My doubt is this. Instead of going to a Bangladesh or a Vietnam or an India or something, 
if somebody figures out that this group of political minorities can be enslaved to produce at free cost, that doesn't mean it's on us. It does not mean it's on us because so they can decide to reduce their profit margins a bit and still probably give us the clothing at the same price. But I think in the system, no one's incentivized to do that yet. Because of the shareholder value yes. maximization? Correct. Concept. Concept. I wonder, we were talking about this backstage, right? I think one kg of cotton is 10,000 liters of water. Oh, I didn't know this. You weren't listening when I was talking no, to you? No, I don't normally listen when you're talking. <laughs> but just imagine that, right? Like there's water also. I, I wonder what the cost of all of this is to the environment, emission-wise. Yeah, emission-wise, it's quite a bit. And the problem is it's for a discretionary purchase, which if we are able to... Like in the sense, right? A lot of fast fashion purchase is stimulated by external stimuli, like marketing campaigns or influencers saying something, etc., etc. So it's strictly a discretionary spend. I think that's okay. Yeah. The problem is that you will discard it after a few months because after the tenth wash, wash, Correct. it's not shiny anymore. Yes, yeah, so that's exactly what I'm saying. In the sense that all of this is happening for something we can easily fix, yeah, like yeah, yeah. try to use it longer or try to not buy so I much. I wonder if it's manufactured in a way so that in the 10th wash, it's not worth it. Hmm. <laughs> I wonder. <laughs> Come on, guys. Fast fashion isn't that bad. I mean, look at the tag on this t-shirt. It says, join life. It means t-shirt is sustainable. Okay, this is all bullshit. Join life logo on the tag simply means that this tag is sustainable. Not the t-shirt, just the tag, not the t-shirt. This is a classic example of greenwashing. And the fast fashion companies are good at greenwashing as Walter White is at cooking, you know what. But greenwashing isn't the only thing these companies are good at. They're also great at slave involuntary labor. Unsafe working conditions, unfair wages, long working hours, child labor and the list goes on and on. In 2013, more than 1,100 workers passed away after a sweatshop collapsed in Bangladesh. The worst part is that these workers had been complaining about cracks for days. But because the sweatshop owner refused to pay salaries if they didn't come in, the workers had no choice but to work. But even after all tragedies, the ethics of fast fashion brands are strong as the pillars of the sweatshop. I mean, think about why these companies have stayed so strong. It's because of their diversity. No, no, not in equity. It's in pollution. Be it land, water or air, fast fashion brands have laid their hands on it all. The textile industry consumes 79 trillion litres of water. That's 4% of the world's fresh water annually and is also responsible for global carbon emissions. 10%. It's more pollution than what automobiles create. But wait! It's not over yet! Over 92 million tons of textile waste is dumped every year. And if you had to imagine that, it's like throwing away a truck full of clothes every second. Because these brands constantly create new fashion and stimulate demand, the consumers get tempted to buy new clothes that they don't even need and possibly won't even wear once. And this is exactly what these brands want. But the consumers, we can talk about this practice, say we don't like it, to slow down the fast trends. Remember, all they're doing is meeting our demands. And your choice can save tens or thousands of litres of water and some money from your pocket. So, what's the solution? Should we just stop buying clothes? Okay, okay but then on a serious note, what can you do? See, for one, right, um, at least for people who can afford it, like I said, right, that, that uh, French Open t-shirt which I was talking about, yeah, yeah. That lasted 15 years. The initial investment in that shirt is obviously higher, but it will last longer. So if people can afford to buy good stuff that lasts a really long time, I think people should make a conscious effort to go to that. Right? And the other thing, of course, is somehow buying environmentally sustainable clothing and using the same old clothes again and again for a long time, that has to be perceived as cool. We had to start the trend where somebody wearing really old clothes. That's really tough. I know it's very tough, but... Talk to your cool friend <laughs> who can do it, because you can't. Okay. But on a serious note, again, again, personal experience, yeah, yeah. Um, I have repaired clothes several times because I don't know, I, I, I have a thing, so it's probably middle class India, you know, peak middle class India thing when you grow up. So I 
actually repair a lot of shoes i don't throw them away yeah and it's it's nice right like so it's, of course there's a cheap thrill that you go to a cobbler and uh, give it to him and he repairs it and gives it back you feel ki oh i saved so much money then you're reusing them then you also feel ki okay you're not throwing it away you're being like a waste person none of that right so i realized that if you are willing to put in a little bit more effort like probably 20 30 minutes more there's so much repairs you can do and there's one more thing right so i recently noticed this right east asian cultures whether india japan korea etc we have like a cultural thing of reduce reuse recycle right like right. when i was when i was small i was handed my elder brothers stuff the hand me downs yeah yeah hand me downs very common stuff right there's nothing and that's considered good it's considered good and we consciously make an effort to so this is joke which we say right in india a shirt starts its life as a t-shirt and at the end of the life cycle it is the mop I I think it's, it's a I think it's a great thing right don't don't why do you want to buy a special microfiber mop right? you can use your own dude no I am serious and this one is microplastic in it yeah, so <laughs> but 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 on a so you can actually I think the most important thing is that you have to have intent once you have the intent that look it's it's just this right i think reduce reuse recycle that concept is beautiful it's just three very powerful words if you consciously make an effort to reduce like redu- reduction is simple and there cool trends also minimalism is yeah. also a trend considered yeah, absolutely, cool absolutely where people live in smaller houses smaller everything and they were happier life and focus on other things and versus these crazy dopamine hits and if you open your wardrobe and if you have very few things to choose so from so nice no life becomes significantly simple no paradox of choice right? no paradox of choice you don't have to worry every day like So, for example, Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, all Zach these boys have the same dress every day. One thing he did good, yeah. So that is one thing. Reuse is again a massive concept. So again, one part of reuse is how many people actually consciously make an effort to donate their clothes and shoes. If it's, it's something which you can really do, right? So, for example, one of the biggest things which uh, I learned is uh, wedding clothes, right? Typically, they get stored one, away as yeah, yeah, yeah. memorabilia or something. Yeah, yeah. But you can actually donate. to an organization on the same day just after your wedding you can donate it oh yeah yeah they'll take it away do that? i do that i did that oh, so that's nice the thing is it actually you somebody else can use it or you know there are a lot of people who don't have privilege they can use it it's almost brand new it's a nice thing right so and you'll never wear it again you'll never wear guaranteed. it again. it's guaranteed i mean <laughs> unless guaranteed unless <laughs> i mean unless <laughs> and finally comes recycling again not a difficult thing to do now india is catching up plenty of places where people are recycling stuff it doesn't take effort to collect everything together and donate it to i mean give it to somebody who will make sure that it is getting recycled yeah if you do all this thing but i think the most important thing is that see it's like this right where there's a will there's a way if you really think ki okay i want to reduce my consumerism and i'm going to find ways to do that it's not difficult to do that i think the change has to come from within it's easy for people to sit around and say ki okay some ngo has to take lead government has to incentivize nothing if everybody thinks ki boss let me just re question the way i am living it and think what i can do uh, maybe abed is right the solution to the fast fashion problem starts at home and just like other problems that you face at home if you don't know how to solve a problem call amma i mean your grandmother yes your grandmother knows the solution and how to reduce your shopping spree reuse some of your clothes and also recycle those old clothes to make something new the concept of reduce reuse and recycle isn't new at all And just like Abid said, uh, Pratik, you know, South Asian cultures have traditional solutions to this problem. You'll be surprised. In Japan, you have kintsugi, where you have small holes in your garments. You can fix them by patching them with gold thread, making them even prettier. In Korea, you have jogakpo and bojong. which is this dress this beautiful gorgeous dress has been made using leftover fabric which would have been thrown away in any other place but korea has culturally used leftovers to create something new and this doesn't end here in china you have the phrase zi bu shi bu lan this proverb which translates to make cloth and mend what's torn This proverb emphasizes the importance of both creating new clothes and taking care of existing ones by mending them. And this is not just restricted to foreign countries. Even back home in India, we have tons of similar solutions across the country that's weaved into our cultural roots. In Himachal Pradesh, we have thangka bags. In West Bengal, we have kantha quilts or carpets that are being used for ages now. 
And in the south, we have one more example. That's the Pochampali weaving technique from Telangana. Not just that, there are several projects or movements run by NGOs too, like Ek Chadar Meri Bhi movement, which helped women gain livelihood by making bed sheets using old saris and clothes. And if you're not still convinced, think about our own families, our own homes. Remember those times when your elder brother would finally hand you his cool T-shirt. When you used your favorite T-shirt to such an extent that one day mom looked at it and said, "Ye ab bocha banega." <sighs> the good old days. Anyway, basically all of these examples and memories only go to show that the solution to this fast fashion is right at home with you taking the first step. So talking about intent, we actually have this um, disconnect between the sh- maximizing of shareholder value, consumption, and companies. Correct. So there's actually an interesting thing I read. You know the company Patagonia, hiking gear, hiking gear stuff, right? So there's a letter by the founder. Let me read parts of it, okay? Um, Earth is now our only shareholder. If we have any hope of a thriving planet, much less a business, it's going to take all of us in doing what we can with the resources what I have. Here's what I want to do. First, one percent of the sales each year we started to give back towards the environment. This is how we started. Top line. Top line. Mm-hmm. After that, we changed the company's purpose to we're in business to save our home planet. Mm-hmm. Now I didn't know how to solve this. First, I thought was to sell Patagonia and take the money and donate it all towards the environment. Second was take it public. But then who would become the new shareholder? Maximization would happen from the shareholder side, and again the vision would be destroyed. Instead of going public, we said we are going purpose. Now hear this out. Hundred percent of the company's voting stock transfers to Patagonia Purpose Trust, which is a new vehicle. Okay. And their job is to protect company's values, etc. And hundred percent of the non-voting stock is given to another com- to to another non-profit called Hold Fast Collective, whose whose purpose is to fight the environment. Mm. Now, the is this marketing speak? Could be. Like I don't know, but I've not read anything like this. Could this actually change the way? Other people also think at least it's a first step. Yeah, it's a first step. Very at massive, least it's a big step. brand doing this. And I think they do all the checks, Abhi, in all the pros and cons we talked about. They massively high quality, built to last. All of those things you can reuse, you can recycle, etc. All those checks are also in place. So maybe um, if more companies did this, things would get a little better. And in this entire thing, right? Fast fashion uses a lot of cotton. Okay. And we have this fight that's happening between traditional cotton. How it's grown with the farmers and this modern cotton, mm-hmm. and you can imagine modern cotton. You want higher yield, big quantities, cheaper, and this is what fast fashion actually demanding. They want more cotton fast in a short period of time, yeah, larger yield. Yeah, because we know why. And all this cotton is actually bad for the farmer because his margin reduces. He has to do fertilizer and all these things to get the yield up. Correct. His margin reduces, but he hopes that the volume is better. Correct. And in India, we use something called BT cotton. I. Think I've heard this name. Uh, genetically modified yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. cotton. Mm. So we thought this since this is interesting, why don't we talk about genetically modified crops and its effects? Oh my world. God, that that looks so natural. In I'm the next episode, <laughs> like and subscribe. See you in the next episode.